Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Looks like we still have a few people joining us, so we'll get started in just a few minutes. Hello, my name is Brian DePaulo, and I'm the Practice Director for Strategic Services at Acadata Systems. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to our webinar, Ransomware, Evolution and Cyber Threat Landscape. During today's webinar, we'll focus on the evolution and distribution of ransomware, as well as best practices for protecting your network and combating an attack. Acudata has been on the forefront of technology innovation since we were founded in 1982. Since that time, we're heavily in, we've invested heavily in emerging technologies that we see as transformative to our customers' way of doing business. Over the past 34 years, we've built a team of highly skilled local consultants who partner with our clients to improve their business through IT, which in the last year included 300 customers who had done business with Acudata for five or more years. For nearly two decades, we've invested heavily in our cybersecurity expertise and today lead the market as a top advisor on, threat, on cyber threat prevention, detection, and remediation. One of the ways we've been able to grow our expertise is through our partners like AlertLogic, who stay on the leading edge and equip our clients with tools they need to protect their business. Specifically, AlertLogic was just named as a leader by Forrester across all managed security service providers. In the report, AlertLogic received the highest score for user interface and integrations, as well as a score of five of, out of five possible points for, uh, on customer experience. Accudate is proud to have a longstanding partnership with AlertLogic and is excited to see their, uh, this industry recognition. So at this time, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Richard Cassidy, Cybersecurity Evangelist with AlertLogic. Richard has spent more than 16 years, uh, 16 years in the technology industry, industry specializing in cloud security, infrastructure, networking, and MDM, to name a few. During the presentation, feel free to submit questions in our Q&A panel. During the last 15 minutes of today's webinar, we'll give Richard the opportunity to answer these questions live. Without further delay, Again, I want to thank you for your time and introduce Richard Cassidy to present Ransomware, Evolution, and Cyber Threat Landscape. Brian, thank you very much indeed, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, Brian's given me a great introduction. Um, and really, I'm going to cover um, a very in-depth look at the evolution and the new distribution methodologies of ransomware. And then probably more importantly on this webinar, uh, talk about the key best practices. And, and, and this is a genuine uh, overview of some of the absolute critical things you must do as an organization to help uh, really thwart the, the latest iterations of ransomware. And we'll talk about some of them as well. Um, so throughout the webinar, uh, please think of questions that you may want to ask. We will be taking questions at the end, and um, we'd love to certainly get some insights on what you're thinking about and, and how you have uh, sort of thought about this, this webinar in general. So let's get started. So really the first thing to talk about, because we're going to come back to it a lot throughout this webinar, and it's the cyber kill chain. <clears throat> now, the cyber kill chain was born out of an exhaustive amount of research, and I can't underest and underestimate how much research has gone into this because it is simply immense amounts um, through Lockheed Martin and, of course, the U.S. Department of Defense. And they took a lot of data um, over decades' worth, and they looked for a commonality, a 
a sort of modus operandi on all threats that they've seen. And they looked for a way that they would proliferate from start to finish. And thus the cyber kill chain was born. And, and normally when we look at threats, they will follow a very distinct path. And as an organization, we can almost assess ourselves, and we'll be going through this a bit more detail later, on how we stack up in each of the key areas. We'll look at it specifically from a ransomware perspective, but be under no illusion to how important this kill chain is from an understanding and education perspective and an overall security uh, platform and uh, solutions approach. What's really interesting in terms of some telemetry from the industry is that attacks are starting to become much more advanced. So they're using uh, multi-stage threat capabilities, and I'll, I'll make that term more simplistic as we go through it with some examples. Uh, essentially, they're hooking into higher layers up the stack uh, to get to the core applications and servers uh, to perform malicious or nefarious activity. What we are seeing, what the industry is confirming, is that organizations have taken a really long time in most average cases to identify that they have been compromised. In fact, what we've seen in terms of overall industry data over the past five or six years is that the average time is about 205 days before detection of compromise. Now, the year before this data was published, it was about 238 days. So we reckon by about 2035, organizations will be down to day zero. Um, and I know that's almost a, a little bit of a poor humor, but in all honesty, that is the path that, that we're seeing organizations go down. Um, and what we want to do today is take you uh, through a journey in understanding these threats and actually get you to a point where you're detecting things pretty much as zero day as we possibly can. What's more concerning on this telemetry is that for organizations that have been compromised, you would think are the ones that are finding out, but actually uh, the, the, the perception couldn't be further from reality. What the industry data has supported is that actually two-thirds of organizations are finding out from a third party that they've been compromised, which means that it's their, their, their consumers in many cases, it's their third party providers, um, it's their service providers um, that are finding out that there's some nefarious activity and then highlighting this up the chain and, and then we're identifying a, a breach. So that's an interesting piece of data and something we certainly want to turn um, on its head essentially from a security and best practices perspective. So before we get started really into the real detail side of ransomware, I think it's really important to understand why the organizations and the groups that are behind ransomware do what they do and their, their mindset, a little bit about the psychology of these distinct groups. And if we look at all of the attacks that are going on out there today and that have gone on in the past and will continue into the future, uh, we can we can whittle it down to three specific groups or three classes of threat actors as we call them. The first, and, and we start with hacktivism because really that's where it all born out. If we think about security uh, groups of bad actors that have been performing activity for quite some time, the whole premise of this is born out of hacktivism. And Anonymous, for instance, which we're probably all well aware of, uh, were a group that came out of Fortran uh, news groups many, many years ago. Um, when I say many years ago, I'm talking in the 90s. They were initially a group that were just looking to identify potential exploits and, and threat vectors on uh, government systems and commercial systems for educational purposes. It was genuinely a altruistic mission uh, initially, but that then changed and it became very politically motivated. And, and here we see Anonymous doing what they're doing today, still very politically motivated and behind a lot of the infrastructure and e-commerce attacks uh, that, we, that, that we're hearing of in the news. Then, of course, out of hacktivism was cyber criminals were born, and that group really is the group that we're hearing a lot of. If we think about the latest threats that we hear about, most of them will be uh, a cyber criminal backed campaign. And cyber criminals are really interested in monetization of any part of your data infrastructure they can get their hands on. And when we go through the server side variants of ransomware that I'll, I'll talk about later, I'll give an example of how easy it is actually for these groups and these bad active campaigners to identify organizations. Um, and I think one of the key things to mention on this slide is we shouldn't get into the, uh, the, the premise of, of security by anonymity, uh, say anonymity, because actually the tools that these cyber criminals are using in these APT groups um, are finding vulnerable servers and vulnerable networks automatically and then bringing it to the attention of these groups at which point a campaign is built. So cyber criminals are really about making as much money as possible for little effort and we'll give an example of some of those types of threat vectors in a moment. And then you have a more recent group which is the APT group and the Advanced Persistent Threat Group 
uh, really the good news before I get into the detail here is unless that 1% of organizations should see threats from an APT group. They, APT groups are the sorts of groups that will take their time and do their homework on the target organization. So you'll be in the laser sights of this group or this particular bad actor, and they will take time on social media, on professional media networks. Uh, they will look at infrastructure on publicly available uh, data through Google, through ISP records, um, and they'll even attempt to do some social engineering type attacks to do some initial reconnaissance. And then they'll write malware and put it through a testbed network in most instances to uh, bypass the latest AV patches and, and firewall security capabilities. Now, in many cases, they succeed, but not in all cases, thankfully. Uh, but these are the sorts of groups that really do take the time. And what we find with APT groups are the most likely nation state sponsored. So we typically find that it's uh, sponsored by governments or organizations in some respects. Um, and in other respects, we find them sponsored by other organizations, certainly from a corporate espionage perspective. And actually, the two groups that focus mainly on ransomware today are your cyber criminal APT groups. And we'll talk more about these as we go through the presentation. So that's a bit of a history of, and a bit of an insight into who we're up against. I think the most important thing is why, right? What is the psychology behind what they're doing? Well, it is all about monetization at the end of the day. Hacktivism is slightly different in that it's really about kudos and, and reputation. Um, but even hacktivism, to a large extent, has to fund itself, so it does lend itself to monetization. But what I'd like you to to the take away from this slide is the complexity and the hierarchy at, with which the underground economy has really matured over the past while. And this may be an eye-opener for some people looking at this webinar. So what you have are different groups that take different responsibilities. And their job is to perhaps uh, focus on malware writing. And this malware gets sold through particular dark web resources. You've got other groups that host denial of service networks and resell their DDoS capabilities to other uh, types of organizations, other bad actor groups on the underground. Um, and then you have people that take raw data, for instance, and will sift out the financial information or the monetized data and sell that on or, or use that to fund other campaigns. And then, of course, you have the, the master criminal group, which are really the responsible people for moving the money, if you like. And in ransomware, that's being done on Bitcoin um, and also on Bitcoin crunching. So this is the ability to, to really move money through Bitcoin accounts and lose the trail because we're sort of mixing it up in so many different wallets. And this is a very short insight into this economy. I could spend a whole webinar just talking about these different types of groups in itself. But if you understand how well oiled, how well orchestrated it is, then you'll get a better idea of, of why you may become a target. And if you are a target, how that data is being monetized. And I'll finish on one point on this slide that don't for one second believe that um, the writers of ransomware or malware applications are coming after specific data, we're starting to see a shift in just resource alone. Being able to take over a server, whether it's you know a server in the physical or a cloud or a hybrid environment, and use that to maybe do Bitcoin mining or as a launch platform for the threats is also becoming very lucrative in the underground economy. So it's not just your data, it's also your resources that are of interest to the underground economy. So we talked about monetization. Well, I wanted to give you an example, really, of how this looks on the dark web. And these are genuine screenshots from the dark web sites that um, we've been able to research here at LearnLogic. So one of them, uh, the top left, is an underground market that resells access to Netflix accounts or PayPal accounts that have been compromised and some other financial-based accounts. Um, and it really is that simple. You would simply go to these sites, pay a nominal Bitcoin value, and then you'd have access to uh, what it says you'd have access to. And in many cases, there is support offered as well. So if you're not getting access to the right uh, level of uh, account, uh, the PayPal account that you purchased or a Netflix account, you know, you'll be finding support on, on certain groups and you'll be given new account details, which do work. Um, and then you see here at the bottom right, uh, this is the DDoS for sale. Um, uh, Bitcoin transaction website on the dark web. So I can go and purchase a DDoS attack against another organization, um, and I just have to choose the duration and the the rate of that attack that I want. And I pay normally between four to five Bitcoins, and I sit back and, and the attack is, is, is proliferated on an automated basis. So it is real. It, it isn't a smoke and mirrors discussion. I'm showing you some real screenshots of some valid dark websites here, just to give you an idea of how your data is monetized. But let's bring it back to ransomware. 
Um, ransomware is becoming much easier for these bad actor groups to, uh, to, to really uh, use and, and capitalize on. And the reason it's becoming easier is because we're finding a new generation of cyber criminals that are using point and click tools. Um, and this is a point and click tool for creating a, a ransomware uh, of a crypto lock to sort of variant, which essentially says, you know, tell me what you want the ransomware to do, send me a list of emails that I can go and target and, and embed malicious links into, um, and this tool will go and perform the um, the, the, the ransomware uh, campaign for you. What's even more frightening is there are dark web sites where I can just upload email lists, and I don't have to do any work. I just provide the data and I will get 40% of any proceeds of ransomware payments that are made. And that's got to raise some eyebrows in terms of security best practices. We think about disgruntled employees. We think about data breaches that you're not responsible for. And this is often the biggest problem. Your emails have been leaked through a, a, a partner's uh, security breach. This is where we have to start to really think about how we poise as organizations to protect ourselves against third-party breaches outside of our control. And even as, as importantly, how do we protect ourselves within our own four walls um, uh, from being a victim of these sorts of breaches and finding ourselves part of a point and click ransomware campaign? So moving on, um, let's talk about ransomware at a high level. Let's discuss the different variants because really it only it boils down to two types of ransomware. Uh, you have crypto and you have locker. L locker is really where it all began. Um, locker variants were simply uh, the early day variants that would show up through a malicious email or a link or a website that might be visited that, that's been compromised. And the, the locker ransomware would essentially just lock files. Um, and in some cases, it would make you think that it's encrypted and by sending you a message saying your files are encrypted, you will not be given access unless uh, you pay for the decryption key. Please click on this link and transfer some bitcoins. And in most cases, if you just looked behind the scenes, you'd have noticed it was just a, a, a locker of a password protection, typically quite weak, and, and it could be, in many cases, reverted and reversed. Um, but crypto has by far become the most popular variation of ransomware. Because what crypto does is it actually encrypts the files. So um, regardless of what you try to do to recover them, um, you know, you, you are in a, a very difficult situation because they're normally encrypted with high levels of encryption. Um, and once it's infected the local system, what we're seeing ransomware variants doing over the past couple of years is, is looking for shadow copies of files and for backups and deleting the backups. So then you couldn't even restore the file locally. Um, so crypto and locker are the two separate variants, but actually they've, uh, they've converged and we're starting to see both variants now amalgamated in, in variations of ransomware. And this slide gives you a history of some of the variants that we've seen in the industry. Um, the first variants were really Trojans, and these are Trojans that infected systems, again, through either brute force password guessing of publicly available resources and then installing uh, data by compromising local system. And again, these initial Trojan version, uh, versions would just lock files. They wouldn't actually encrypt them, which meant it was fairly easy to recover the data. And then we started to move on and we started to see uh, other variants and crypto lockers sort of surfaced in 2013. And between crypto locker and the initial Trojan based, um, there were a number of ones that were starting to get to the crypto locker basis. And then we start to see today, and, and Torrent Locker is, is certainly one of the, the most prolific at the moment, although I'm going to bring your attention to some even more prolific ransomware variants that we're seeing. So it's interesting to see how popular ransomware has become, specifically from 2012 onwards. There's been a huge number of releases, and that has to tell you something about the direction that malware is going in in terms of bad actor campaigns. So... Let's look at some industry analysis around ransomware. Um, and no, probably no surprise is really how ransomware has proliferated over the past couple of years. In fact, there's been a 500% increase overall in ransomware infections reported. And we estimate through research that about 51 million endpoints were targeted in the end of last year alone, which is a substantial number of endpoints. Um, but what's most concerning about the data that we're seeing in the terms of proliferation of ransomware is the increase in server-side variants. And server-side variants uh, are raising many eyebrows in the security world because they're becoming very, very difficult to, to prevent and even very more difficult to detect because of the way that they're being written. And we'll deep dive into that as we go through the presentation. So we've given you a bit of a background on the mindset of the types of actors and groups that will target you. We've shown you the monetization um, of the activities that these bad actors uh, perform. And then we've talked a little bit about ransomware. 
So let's dissect ransomware and let's keep that uh, in, in situ with the kill chain that we talked about earlier in the presentation. <clears throat> so if we look at ransomware and we apply it to the kill chain, actually it's fairly easy to do. Um, and the five steps that happen in the kill chain, ransomware does follow those five steps. <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, if you take it back to an assessment platform here, if we look at the kill chain and assess my functionality or my capability around detecting ransomware and preventing it, then you'll be able to, as we go through this webinar, highlight your strengths and in some cases your weaknesses. <clears throat> so the first part is identifying reconnaissance. So this is typically where an organization will become a target um, of a ransomware campaign. Now, typically, um, we are a target of a general ransomware campaign. There are very few organizations that find themselves a specific target of a, of a, of a specific group. Um, in many cases, you're just caught up in a, in a, in a sweep of emails uh, that have been sent to your domain, and hopefully a user in your business will click on the link and, and a malware a wooden form of ransomware will be downloaded. However, the service side exploits are less um, spray and pray, if you like. They're more targeted because they're looking for specific vulnerabilities that exist in specific variants of ransomware. Now, from a, a identify and recon phase, um, we can still detect this. We'll talk about how we do that later. We can still be fairly well poised as an organization to detect when we are being targeted by very advanced versions of, of ransomware. Now, past the recon stage, past the initial identification that you will be a, a suitable um, uh, organization to target, the next stage has to be the initial attack. And this is where we see the delivery of the infected payload. Now, in most cases, in fact, in 98% of cases, the ransomware itself is delivered in an email. And in fact, phishing campaigns are still the number one propagation method of ransomware. And typically, it will have a file that's embedded within the email that we would, we would hope a user would open. And when the user opens that file, it will execute um, an installation of the ransomware and then go about performing its functions. In other cases, it's malicious websites. And what I mean by this, just to give you some background on it, is a website that has been compromised through its own weakness. And then what will happen is the, uh, the ransomware malware writer will use the server that's been compromised to upload files to users that may visit that site because it's a site that most users trust and they will accept file transfers from that site. In other cases, it's a little bit more complicated. It's vulnerabilities that may exist in your web browser. And what we find these infected sites doing is they're looking for these vulnerabilities. And these are called web exploit kits. So when you connect to this website, and it will search vulnerabilities in your browser. Once it identifies that vulnerability, it will use that vulnerability to upload a Trojan, or in some cases, the ransomware itself. And then at that point, we get to what's called the command and control phase. And this is where the ransomware needs to get the public key to encrypt the data on the target systems. And so there has to be communication there between the, the source network of the malware, of the ransomware, and there has to be an exchange of these keys. And at that point, once the keys are exchanged, then the ransomware is poised to go back to the encryption and removal of the original data. In some cases, and there are a few that have proliferated recently, there's the spread phase. So not many ransomware variants do spread automatically. Um, they're not like your traditional sort of polymorphic worm type propagation uh, malware, um, but some have been able to propagate. We, we've witnessed this in some of our own research. So this is where they look within the host environment that they've compromised for other uh, uh, devices, in most cases servers and, and, and user desktops and laptops, and they would attempt to proliferate themselves to those devices. In some cases, doing that very successfully, but they tend to be quite noisy. So from a spread phase, most organizations can be well poised to detect the uh, propagation methodology of spreading within your environment. We'll talk about that a little bit later. If all being said and done, we haven't been able to detect any of these stages, we get to what's called the extract phase. But in this case, it's actually completion of the encryption and the locking function of the malware. And then this is where the bad news pops up on your browser or, or, or on your desktop and saying you need to pay a ransomware um, uh, payment and that will give you decryption. But not in all cases, I'm afraid. We have seen some organizations that have been hit by ransomware pay the ransom and it was never going to be uh, uh, honored and they were never given the decryption keys and they were left in the same state as they 
initially started. So not all ransomware will, will pay. It's it's really a hit and miss in terms of um, the, the the overall sort of functionality. So let's dissect that a little bit more. So we talked at a high level how ransomware proliferates, and we've really tied that to the kill chain, which is a great assessment platform for, you know, where do you as an organization see yourself being able to detect ransomware? Are you able to detect it early on in the kill chain, or are your current set of security tools and capabilities better for detecting mid or, or end of that chain? Um, so let's talk about the difference between client side and server side, because this is where we're seeing a huge shift today. As I said, ransomware has now been written to compromise servers, which isn't something we'd seen really in 2013 and 14. It sort of started to show in 2015, and now very much so in 2016. So everybody will or may have heard of server, and server is one of the most prolific versions of client side ransomware that are uh, hitting the industry today. And there are two variants of server. One is the ability to uh, propagate itself through phishing emails. So going back to my previous explanation, if an email with an infected attachment or a link that will be uh, connected to an infected download, that gets access to the local system. And then the ransomware executes. The great thing, or the bad thing about server, I suppose, great thing if you're a security geek like myself and you like to see clever applications being written, the bad thing if you happen to be a victim of it, is that it searches for backups and shadow copies on the local systems. And, and ransomware typically didn't do this. It just took a guess at where system files and folders may, may sit, and it would encrypt these key system files. But server actually seeks out the backups and the shadow copies, and does a very good job at detecting the user's personal folders and the, the critical system files. And, and other than deleting the backups and shadow copies, which is a bad thing in of itself, it also encrypts very, very efficiently the uh, system files and the user's uh, local documents and pictures and videos and so on and so forth. Um, and server typically does uh, decrypt itself when you pay the Bitcoin. We haven't had many examples where it hasn't, which is good news at the moment, but that certainly by no means means that it will continue to do that. And then probably more interesting and more um, concerning is that there's a, a server side variation of, 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 of server. What I mean by that is it doesn't need users to click on a malicious link or open a malicious application in an email. They can just visit a malicious website. And one of the most common ways that you will fall foul of this type of threat is by what's called a typo squatting attack. And I'll give you some background on that because this is quite important. We all have, and the term is fat-fingered website addresses, right? You want to go www.google.com and you put in too many O's, um, or you want to go to Microsoft or you've spelt it wrong, um, or whatever it is that the, the online banking uh, company is or organizations that you use, you just get a character wrong. And bad actors know this, and they actually register domains, malicious domains that are those uh, uh, typo errors, essentially. And they will put in a lot of homework to make it look like the site that you think it was that you're visiting. Um, and you will log in and give your credentials uh, in some cases, and you will have given your credentials to a bad actor group. Um, in other cases, they'll just make that website infected with uh, malicious files. So when your browser exchanges backend files and processes with the web server, it's actually exchanging malicious files, um, which in most cases is a Trojan, which then goes about doing the the the, the, the more depth in depth work of downloading the malicious file. So these this is the the other way that server can propagate, and it's sometimes harder to detect. Um, and it goes about doing exactly the same things as the, the phishing born variation does. Now, there are many examples of customers that have been hit by client side ransomware. Um, unfortunately, it's very hard to find people that will come public with the data. And that's obvious. As an organization, we certainly don't want to be singing from the rooftops about a ransomware uh, breach. Uh, but one example was a, a, a police department. Uh, that was hit by a client-side variation. And it came over, no surprises, a spam uh, phishing uh, uh, campaign. And unfortunately, an employee clicked on a link in that phishing email and downloaded the malware. Now, I have to defend, I suppose, this type of propagation in some respects, because it goes back to the nature of human psychology. The ransomware campaigners will <clears throat> normally try to create a, a phishing email that is off the back of something that is current, right? So it could be a political campaign with the, the current elections in the United States. It could be uh, some demise of a company or some breach that's happened to a financial organization. And they'll write an email saying, 
uh, you know, you need to perform some action to stay a part of this um, organization or to show your support for whatever presidential candidate you may be voting for. Um, or it may be saying, hey, we have an invoice for you to check and you just may happen to have ordered something online at that point in time or in the last couple of days. And it, 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 it sort of talks to you. you. You are the unfortunate victim that just happens to be most likely to be susceptible at that point in time. And this is what happened in this case. And it wasn't just a blind click on a link without any potential thought behind it. It just seemed to be a genuine uh, in email which contains some invoice data. Anyway, downloaded the client side ransomware and it did all of the things I described in the previous slides. The impact is probably the biggest concern, right? Because there's a huge amount of operational disruption, especially if you're a police department. Um, and this particular police department had to revert back to manual processes uh, to, to deal with, with, with local uh, reports of crime and, and, and wrongdoings. And that sort of had a, a huge increase on in response times and, and, and potentially put people's lives at risk. So it's a very, very unfortunate circumstance, but certainly this isn't the only isolated case. And now let's shift the discussion to the server side ransomware. So SamSam is probably something you may have heard of. Um, SamSam really is a particular variation of ransomware um, that actually uh, exploits uh, a, a JBoss vulnerability. And so what I'll do is I'll give you a bit more background on to what that really means. So, so JBoss or J-E-X-Boss as it's spelt is a, a basically a, an application server um, framework uh, that has been used quite quite regularly. It's becoming very popular now um, for uh, sort of media and, and e-commerce type um, web applications. It doesn't mean it's limited to that, but it's just very popular in that sort of vertical. And what um, is essentially happening is the Samsung ransomware, and I'll talk more about the actual ransomware in a moment. Let's talk about the JBoss vulnerability. So the JBoss vulnerability that exists allows the particular vulnerability or the attacker that exploits it to upload a remote shell. And a remote shell is essentially a backdoor administrative console to that web server. So when a remote shell is uploaded to the JBoss server, it basically gives the attacker carte blanche access to the website. And they can install files or download files or change web pages or search for password files or SQL backend or Oracle backend connections and pretty much go about doing almost any type of nefarious activity that takes their fancy. In this case, what the vulnerability has been used for is for the download of SamSam. <clears throat> now, let me tell you a little bit more about SamSam. So SamSam is very unlike conventional ransomware. It's not actually delivered by these drive-by downloads or emails that we talked about uh, in the previous example. Instead, the, the attackers behind SamSam use this JBoss, JBoss vulnerability to uh, download it through the uh, web shell X, uh, that's been uploaded. So it's deployed locally to the server and it goes about encrypting files on the systems before demanding a ransom. However, what's interesting about, about SamSam uh, is it differs from a lot of the server-side ransom that we've been seeing because what the attackers do here is they actually generate their own key pair for encryption themselves. And what does that mean in layman's terms? Well, typically, if ransomware infects a system, it needs to communicate to a command and control network to get that key to perform the encryption. Now, in many cases, that's a good thing from a security perspective because we can detect that communication because we can detect the key exchange request. And then if we have the right security protocols in place, we can shut it down quite quickly. But Samsung doesn't do that. The key is already embedded in the ransomware application. So there's no key exchange needed. So it's, you can pick that up. Um, and it then goes about encrypting things locally. So it's much, much more difficult to detect. Um, and a lot of work has gone into writing this. Um, so that suggests that there's a fairly well-known, capable uh, bad actor group behind this. Um, and uh, that's the unfortunate point of the Samsung ransomware and how it proliferates, is it doesn't do an exchange of the keys. So once it's installed, it goes about doing encryption. And at the moment, it's requesting an average of 45 Bitcoins to decrypt. Typically, most servers will have uh, some very sort of uh, key assets of data sat on them. And we have uh, been aware of some organizations that have paid this ransomware. Um, uh, and they put it down as a security consultancy cost on their books because the cost of recovering the data is just, in some cases, it's, it's, you can't really put a cost on it. So paying $18,500 to, to have it recovered seems like a fair bet and a fair gain to some of these organizations. 
and in some cases, unfortunately, it doesn't lead to decryption, but it just happens to be uh, a point to, to talk about so that you understand that, that, that this is really how server-side ransomware is working, and this is the value that server-side ransomware is to bad actor groups. If you think about it, one to two bitcoins for client-side versus 45 for server-side, I can absolutely guarantee you that this, the rest of this year, and certainly for 2017, you will be seeing a lot more server-side ransomware variants hitting the market uh, for this very reason, that it's just much, so much more lucrative to the campaigners that are writing in. Now, there are a lot of high-profile examples of um, healthcare organizations that have been hit by the SamSam ransomware. Um, it doesn't mean that the healthcare organizations are the only targets. We have started to see this bleed into educational organizations, and so we're not quite sure what's following that path. It doesn't mean that healthcare and education will be the only uh, targets. We fully expect to see some high-profile e-commerce, finance, manufacturing, um, and media-type organizations being uh, coming to the forefront with some unfortunate news they have been a victim of SamSam. And unfortunately for the healthcare organization, the impact is, is very substantial. As a hospital, you know, there's huge operation disruption. Uh, if you think about loss of access to the patient records, and this is typically and why the Samsung ransomware has targeted healthcare, because if you encrypt the medical database uh, of the patient records, you essentially shut down the operations of that hospital. And the chances are, if we just think again about human psychology and panic mode, is that those hospitals will pay in the hope that they can get back to normal operations, because without the patient data, they really can't function. And, and unfortunately, and, and, and without surprise, these organizations have been paying the ransomware because they've been left with no choice. And I'm sorry to go into a lot of detail about it, but I really just wanted to give you a background and open your eyes into the variants that we're seeing and why organizations are paying up in the first place and why the bad actors are targeting the types of organizations they are. So now let's move really into the, the section that deals with, you know, what is the, what are the mitigation uh, steps around ransomware. How can we really protect ourselves better? And what are the best practices we can follow? Because I've probably talked about some very serious examples, and, and you may be sitting there thinking, you know, that it almost seems like it's not possible for some of these variants to detect. Well, it actually is. It just depends on your, your framework that you have in place from a security perspective, how you align to that cyber kill chain. And let's start with that again. So ransomware detection and mitigation really follows three phases, and these are really important phases. The first phase is monitor identification. Now, detecting ransomware requires monitoring across all layers of the technology stack. I'm talking from application right down to the network itself. So monitoring transactions to those applications, monitoring the flows of the data in and out of the network, monitoring users' access to particular resources, and capturing all of that data and converging it onto a platform that allows you to effectively apply threat intelligence and research and good content that's looking for the indicators of compromise that fit into that kill chain for ransomware. And the most important is the real-time inspection. Right? What we don't want to be doing is having systems generate logs of potential indicators of compromise and having nobody inspect that data because it's, it's almost uh, you know, not really worth having the data in the first place if we're not actually inspecting it across all of the converged data points. And I know that may seem like a very sensible step, but there are many organizations that don't quite have the right data. They're not actually looking across the entire stack, even though they may think they are. And even when they do that, they're applying um, a, a sort of rudimentary level of inspection through automated tools. And one thing I can absolutely guarantee you from having been in the security industry for over 18 years is automated tools, whilst they are very good at detecting a large proportion of threats, are, are really struggling with these latest variants of ransomware. And you need a level of human intelligence applied to that data inspection. And we'll talk about that later. The second phase is the detection phase. So, so we need to detect that. And that's why I talked about having 24-7 monitoring by expert analysis. And I'm not just talking automated. I'm talking human intelligence also that looks at these IOCs, whether the client, whether the server, and, and looks into the data very, very quickly and identifies whether we're seeing ransomware type activity. And once that's seen, we have to contain it. And we have to have a process and a framework in place that immediately allows us to quarantine, control, and block this ransomware. And I'm talking about all sorts of different functionalities and capabilities here from good network access control policies, from good uh, you know, user identity access management policies, the ability to quarantine things off the network in a very 
efficient automated function and the ability then to close down the doors, whichever doors have been opened by the ransomware as quickly and as effective as possible. Then the final and most important phase really is the respond and mitigate. So having a response or an incident response plan in play for ransomware specifically is not a bad step to take as an organization. Many organizations look at it from a security incident response perspective in inverted commas. Um, and actually, that's well and good for most threats, but ransomware has to be dealt with very quickly and very differently. So an incident response plan built around ransomware specifically is going to be very, very important. Making sure you understand how that ransomware got in in the first place. What did it infect? Are there any other networks or users I should quarantine as a potential? I may have got the server, but did that ransomware move from that server to other, other endpoints? And ensuring most importantly that we educate and communicate with our users and our staff that there has been a ransomware breach and that everybody should be on high alert and, and in, in increased vigilance on online communications and internal communications. And then updating our best practices to make sure that we learn from how that particular ransomware may have targeted us or even in, unfortunately breached us if we are at that point and making sure that we, we prevent these things from happening in the future. And, and that isn't a, an easy task. I, I appreciate that. But it is a science, right? It's not an art. And it's a clinical set of steps that you can follow as an organization to absolutely put yourself in the best possible place to detect even the most zero-day variants of ransomware today. So let's talk about the best practices in summary. Um, and in no real particular order, although backup strategy is at the top because it is absolutely the most important of them all. Um, you know, there will be zero-day variants that will hit the market that there are just no capability to detect. And that's just the unfortunate fact of the security industry. And it's the backup capabilities and recovery capabilities of your organization that's going to dictate whether you'll be able to recover from a very significant or serious ransomware breach. A lot of organizations have a great backup system in place, but these backups are online. They can be accessed by some of the new variants and be deleted as a result of that. So we're talking about good encryption, good a good access control to that to those backups. You know, not just allowing any desktop or server to access backups, having an offline version of your most critical data that can be recovered from it in case it all goes horribly wrong. And there's a new variant that even finds a way to work around some of this, you know, advanced trust modeling and identity access management protocols that we'll be putting in place throughout the rest of the year and into 2017. So backup strategy is going to be key for you to be able to sleep at night and say, even if it's the most serious ransomware variant on the market, I know that I have a backup strategy that will recover my business within a set number of hours a day. And you'll be surprised at how many organizations fail to understand the criticality of a good backup strategy. The second is patch management. Um, and interestingly, you've heard the patch management story as organizations been spoken about for quite a period of time. But actually, the Samsam variant that's being propagating is down to a vulnerability existing in JBoss, a vulnerability that was patched several months ago. So organizations that are falling foul or victim to Samsam are falling victim to it because they have unpatched JBoss servers that are allowing the web shell to be uploaded. I know patch management is probably one of the biggest headaches we have from a security perspective as organizations, but it's absolutely the second most critical point in your best practices approach to detecting ransomware. And then we go to the next five endpoint security tools that are good at detecting the latest variants, um, good log management and inspection strategy. OK, you know, logs are your gold mine of data. You, all activity, all threat activity can be detected through your logs. So getting your log data, looking at it and classifying it and inspecting it properly is going to be key to detecting the most zero day variants of, of ransomware where your endpoint security tools fail, your logs should succeed. Data classification inspection is important. What we mean by this is really putting a ring fence around your key the assets as an organization. So knowing where your ransomware targets will be and making sure you've got the best possible security practices around them or frameworks around those, uh, those data silos as you've classified them and making sure you're inspecting them at the right levels to detect the ransomware activity. Um, and probably I'd say this is the third most important, although it's it's down the list in position six, is a cybersecurity awareness program. <clears throat> if you educate your users on <clears throat> how ransomware propagates and what they should look out for from a ransomware perspective, you're going to find far less susceptibility to ransomware campaigns. Because like I said, 
98% of ransomware campaigns are still being proliferated and propagated through phishing email campaigns. So if we're educating our users on looking for these types of, of, of communications, we're, we're going to put ourselves in a much better position to uh, not fall uh, foul or victim of these ransomware um, threats. And, and that's about staying informed, okay? And, and normally that's the job of your security service provider, but actually as organizations, we should also be keeping our eyes on what's happening from a ransomware perspective and then questioning back into our own organization at sea level and at managerial and at engineering level, how do we stack up to detect these vulnerabilities that we are learning about because we're staying one step ahead of. So they're the best practices. To talk a little bit about alert logic and, and our approach to this problem specifically. So this really will, if you like, sort of marry up all of the key points I talked about in, in some of the previous slides. The first thing is you can't control what you can see. Visibility is absolutely key. It's one of the first points I talked about. You need to be able to see all the transactions across your web application layer, uh, your server side log data, your, your network and security devices log data, and actually the network packets themselves, right? The communication from the web into your network and the communication from within your network to other key points within your network. Once you can see all that data, you can start to collect it. And then what you need to then do is apply a level of threat analytics to that. And Alert Logic, we have uh, uh, probably one of the biggest data silos um, uh, in the world of threat data. Right? We have over set six pet petabytes of customer data that we're able to use and leverage to detect new variations or to detect uh, you know, existing variations of, of ransomware and malware and different types of threat vectors. But that analytics platform has to be very good at detecting the IOCs, and that's only driven by good threat intel security content, so a team that is proactively searching uh, for the latest variants, dissecting it down for you, creating the signatures and the rules that detect the even most advanced type of ransomware variants out there, and applying that content to an analytics platform that can, can detect it. And then, most importantly, it's the human element. It's the 24-7 monitoring capability by expert analysts. So your analytics platform and your threat intel security content team may be good at identifying a potential problem, Really, the only people that can tell you that you have a problem is 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 not an automated system. It's a it's an analyst that looks at that data and within a very strict SLA. In fact, alert logic, it's within 15 minutes to say, hey, we well, looked at this data. We can tell you that it's it's performing like a new version of ransomware, or it is actually this ransomware variant. It's coming from these sources. It's attacking these destinations, and most importantly, giving you as an organization almost like a recipe for remediation. And that's what we do at Alert Logic. We provide a, a steps of remediation with our incident data to customers to say, here's how you can stop this right now, and here's what you need to think about in future to prevent yourself from being targeted in the same way. Um, and that needs to be a constant process. It needs to be continually updated um, and, and communicated to you as an organization. You need to feel a part of that ecosystem, not just a, a receipt of that. Okay, so really we have some examples of that, and we're going to wrap up shortly for some questions. So um, hopefully you, you might have some of the thought about some of the things I've talked about. Um, but in these examples, these are really the points that I talked about earlier. And this was particularly a, a, an e-commerce customer that was hit by crypto wall ransomware. And they had actually Citrix gateway server that was providing VDI connections into the organization. Um, and that gateway server itself actually became infected with a particular type of malware. Um, and the malware then downloaded a ransomware uh, variant to the gateway server in the hope that it could propagate it to all of the remote virtual desktops that were connecting in. Um, and in some cases, not just virtual desktops, but physical devices. And what it was doing was it was communicating with a malicious IP that we had known through our own threat intel to be linked to ransomware campaigns. So the analyst got a notification from our analytics platform that this was happening, but then went about looking at the data. Within seven minutes, had gone into it in great detail and found that actually it was a ransomware type of activity, um, and it was communicating with a known ransomware source, and then we communicated that to the customer, and within a further 30 minutes, they had completely contained the outbreak and prevented themselves from losing a great deal of data. Another example, uh, we'll talk about server. Well, this is the server variant here that hit one of our customers, a manufacturing customer. And again, a very similar process. We saw through log data um, some unusual activity on the servers that were being targeted. Um, and we saw the Trojan communicate back with a known um, malicious IP destination. And within four minutes of looking at a large amount of data, we escalated the customer that particular type of activity. We explained where they were uh, being contacted from, 
the IPs they should be blocking and also the steps they should be taking internally to detect the server ransomware that we had seen communicate in and outbound. And it took the customer only 11 minutes in this case to shut the doors and contain the threats. And this is quite a key part, containment. So I hope you certainly found this interesting. There's a great deal of further resources available, um, not just here at the Logic Interactive Data, but also on the general uh, World Wide Web. Um, and we would, we would certainly um, ask you to follow them. Um, and of course, at Logic, we have our own resources talking specifically about ransomware for you to look at as well. I hope you found it very interesting. Um, and at this point, we will um, open it out to questions. So thank you very much, uh, Richard, for your great insight. That was, that was, uh, that was fantastic. Um, at this time, we're going to begin the live Q&A session. Uh, during the webinar, we've re we received a few questions, and um, uh, I'm going to go over those now. But if you do, uh, do want to submit anything more at this time, please do, um, and we can, we can go over those. So to, to kick this off, um, uh, I'd say the first question is, what are, what are the user education steps included? I'm sorry, what are the user education steps included um, in terms of what, what, should the, what, what actions should the user take if they believe they've been infected with ransomware? Uh, that's a, a very good question. Um, I'll, I'll take that, absolutely. So this is really down to how well you create a fire drill that your customers can follow if they believe they've fallen, uh, so your customers, your users as well, uh, victim to ransomware. And what the user should be doing is notifying immediately the responsible security personnel within the organization because there is a whole load of other tasks that need to be completed to contain the outbreak. But what the user should, should absolutely do is have a way of removing themselves from the network and uh, protecting themselves from being the platform for a further ransomware breach of other uh, endpoints and verifying what data has been encrypted. That's the most important part. What have I lost? Because then we can go about starting the recovery process. So there's three critical steps. Notification to the relevant people, disconnection, removal from the network environment, and thirdly, identification of what's been uh, targeted so that we can start to get that data recovered. Uh, thank you, Richard. Um, I've got another question that came in. Um, who should be notified during a ransomware event? Um, so I guess beyond just the user, uh, the user that was infected, but who should be notified? And would this, would this activate your incident response plan? Um, another great question. Um, clearly there's been a lot of attention paid to the content um, because I talked about incident response, but I didn't go into it in detail. Um, and actually, incident response is, is a huge subject in of itself, but we'll touch on it basically um, from a ransomware perspective. So uh, organizations that don't have a ransomware incident response plan are the ones that are going to find themselves in a situation that if they are breached by ransomware, the, the effects will be far wider reaching than those that have had a ransomware incident response plan. And really what that should entail is uh, essentially a hotline, a, a hot desk communication platform that I can connect to straight away that I will get a response to within minutes uh, that, has, that, that is aware that this is a ransomware source potential on an infected endpoint. And this is organization's responsibility to assign a level of priority to any ransomware type communication from its users so they know that they have a critical problem to focus on. And the incident response plan will then, in, it will then itself define communication to your, uh, your security infrastructure team, your desktop and applications team, and more importantly, your backup recovery and service specialist, the guys that are going to be able to ring fence the data that the ransomware is coming after and get you backed up and recovered as quickly as possible. Um, so we could go into this response in great level of detail, but they're the three high-level separate teams that need to be responsible. Um, and most importantly is communication back into the network uh, saying that there has been a contained breach. Can everybody please check for the following signs and symptoms and then report back into that incident response plan um, if they do see that uh, case. Uh, but that's a discussion that, you know, if anybody has uh, and wants to go into more detail on, we'd very happily do this as a follow-up step for you uh, past this, this webinar because it's a very important um, point to take into account. No, thank you. That, that was good insight. Um, I guess we'll go with one last question. Um, is restricting end-user privileges part of the ransomware strategy? Um, absolutely resounding, yes. Um, so one of the things you, you, the industry is talking about is trust modeling and trust relationships and effective identity and access management capabilities. And it couldn't be more critical now in the wave of ransomware than it ever has been. 
you know, most of the cloud-based breaches that we're seeing and even the, the hosted-based breaches are down to poor identity access management uh, controls. In fact, some of the most high-profile breaches, uh, and I, can't, I won't name any of the companies in this webinar, but we'll happily have offline discussions about some of the examples, were breached more heavily because of poor identity access management and user restrictions. So as an organization, understanding users' rights and giving them access at the least possible privileges is going to be key in containing the ransomware variants that like to propagate themselves um, exploiting weak in identity access management and trust profiles. So the answer is yes, and that is a point that, again, we would love to discuss with you uh, post this webinar to help you understand how you can go about making those steps. Thank you, Richard. Well, at this time, uh, as we conclude, I'd like to offer a complimentary ransomware posture review with our team to discuss your current capabilities as well as options to mitigate ransomware. Additionally, Accudata can perform vulnerability assessment services to help identify those vulnerabilities in the environment, as, as uh, uh, Richard had mentioned about the JBoss vulnerability and so on, um, as well as the Backman Recovery Health Check to help you identify how quickly you could uh, respond to a ransomware event. Um, if you're interested, please contact me. Uh, my contact information is in this, uh, on this slide, as well as uh, you can contact your Accudata account manager if you know who that is. Um, at this time, that concludes our webinar. Thank you again for joining us today, and have a great day.